All right, the Crusades, let's talk about them. What were they? <clears throat> First of all, as we talked about last time, important point, that's not a word they used. So right off the bat, we are harming our understanding of what's going on by using a word that they didn't use and forgetting that they called what they were doing a pilgrimage, a penitential pilgrimage. They also used the Latin words for journey and expedition. And because when they went on a crusade, they tended to identify themselves with cloth crosses on their clothes. They tended to be called in Latin crucis signati, which means cross signed ones, cross signed people. So pilgrimage, a journey, an expedition of crucis signati, a particular kind of pilgrim, a cross signed pilgrim. And our, our use of the word crusade, which comes from the Latin word crucis signati through the Western languages, tends to confer, or confuse rather, the issue a little bit. So what were they? Let me give you a definition of them. They are penitential pilgrimages. I'll go slow and repeat it for you. Penitential pilgrimages under papal direction, which again is one of the reasons why after 1517, after the 16th century, after the Reformation, there's a sharp drop in crusading, because if you're not going to acknowledge the Pope, then you're not going on a crusade. Uh, whatever you're doing, it's not a crusade. There are some historians who argue with that definition. That is the one that has been most generally accepted by crusade historians. Penitential pilgr pilgrimages under papal direction, with the participants taking temporary vows in return for spiritual benefits, and that's a point where Protestants are going to have an issue. They're going to say it's cool to go on crusade, to borrow your term, John, if I may be allowed to do that. Uh, whereas the Catholic is going to say, no, it's spiritually irradiating. That's the difference between the sacramental view of reality and the non-sacramental view. Catholics are sacramental. Penitential pilgrimages under papal direction with participants taking temporary vows in return for spiritual benefits. Usually an indulgence of some kind or another. Usually aimed at Jerusalem, but not necessarily. What it must be named, a aimed at rather, is the defense of Christendom. Again, after 16th, the 16th century, there's a problem defining Christendom, and after Treaty of Westphalia, people kind of give up on even the idea of Christendom. Uh, the defense of Christendom. And this is why you will sometimes find people saying, oh, those terrible crusaders, they're a bunch of racists and, and religious bigots who hate Muslims, and they didn't even understand Muslims very well because they called them pagans. <coughs> By the way, the Muslims called the Christians polytheists, and still do, if you want to talk about misunderstanding. Uh, that's not why they did it. They did it because they didn't care very much who the other guy was that was attacking Christendom. They cared that he was attacking Christendom. Does that make sense? The problem here is not that you're a Muslim or you're a whatever. Certainly isn't racial because medieval people do not think, did not think about race the way modern people, especially modern people after Charles Darwin, think about race. They didn't think about it that way. The problem is somebody's attacking Christendom and we've got to do something to defend it. And that defensive point is very, very important because crusades, as they were directed by the papacy, were always considered conceived as defensive. I told you before, there was a theologian, fairly major one, who argued that crusades could be kind of offensive, but the popes never accepted that argument. So crusades are always conceived as defensive. Notice the way I said that. That doesn't mean that every single thing they do is defensive, and it doesn't mean they always live up to the ideal. That's the conception. That's the ideal. In the introduction, we mentioned that there were centuries of conflict between Islam and Christianity. Let's look at this a little bit more in the background to the Crusades, beginning around 1000. Around 1000, Sunni Muslims uh, in the Baghdad-based Abbasid Caliphate controlled most of the Middle Eastern world, Muslim world. The chief exception was Egypt, which was held by a Shiite dynasty called the Fatimids. There's all kinds of reasons for this stuff, but this isn't an Islam lecture, so we will avoid the reasons. 
That's the case in about 1000. Then in 1055, remember, Seljuk Turkish mercenaries took over Baghdad, ostensibly to protect it. And the Abbasid Caliph became a figurehead. And the Sunni world fragmented into local provincial powers, usually called emirates. E-M-I-R-A-T-E-S, emirates. There was still a caliph, but he was a rubber stamper. He was a figurehead. And roughly the next half century after 1055, really is about 50, 55 years, the, it's a moment of serious and unusual weakness for the Muslim world. Chaos, disorder. And from the Muslim point of view, that is a rotten, rotten time to have a major Western Christian military incursion because they're not set up to meet it, kind of uniquely not. Now the Seljuks themselves, the Seljuk Turks, were formidable warriors. When the Crusaders met them on the First Crusade, they wrote back home and said, if these guys were Christians, they'd be the finest knights in the world. They'd be better than we are. Uh, and I don't know how you rate people exactly, but there's no question that the Seljuk Turks always were formidable warriors. And they set up uh, some emirates moving into Syria. And in 1071, one of them attacked into Eastern Asia Minor. The Eastern Roman or Byzantine emperor went out to meet them. I really actually don't like the term Byzantine because it also, like the term crusade, deceives you about what the, what's going on, but it's really widely used. So Byzantines. The Byzantine army goes out to meet them at near the little village of Manzikert, M-A-N-Z-I-K-E-R-T and is shattered. It's a terrible defeat and the emperor is taken prisoner. Without getting into the Byzantine politics that follow that, the Byzantines appeal for help to the Pope. Why the Pope? Isn't he a church leader? Why don't they appeal to the emperor or the French king? Because the Pope is viewed by the Byzantines as more or less the functional heir to Western imperial power and the person that's most likely to be helpful to them. So they ask the Pope for help. And apparently we're hoping to draw on long-standing habits they had of the recruitment of Western mercenaries. In particular, they valued Norman heavy cavalry, which were pretty much the finest soldiers in the Western world. But they didn't get much of an answer at first, um, partly because of some things that were going on in the West. Somebody mentioned the investiture controversy in, uh, in 1074, 1073. Pope Gregory VII received these appeals and he was, uh, by all appearances, emotionally moved as well as, as politically uh, inclined to respond and he said, he sent word back that he would send a military expedition to help them which he himself would lead. No Pope actually ever did lead a crusade but that's what Gregory was proposing in the 1070s but then two years later in 1076, uh, Henry IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, a little bit of an anachronistic term, but that's what the office becomes. The German emperor uh, launches a full-scale attack on the papacy, <coughs> which lasts for some time. It's the investiture controversy from 1076 to 1122. And it's an interesting thing to do to look at Gregory VII's register of papal documents. You can do it in English because it's been translated. There's a flurry of documents written into his register, uh, writing to this or that aristocratic lord saying, I need you to bring these many people. I need you to be here at this time. We're going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then all of a sudden it stops in 1076 with the beginning of the investiture controversy. He has no time. He has no resources. He can't do anything else. So the idea is shelved, but not forgotten. It's not forgotten by the papal office, and it's not forgotten by the imperial office, the Byzantine office. In the 1080s and 1090s, Emperor Alexius I of Constantinople, the Byzantine or East Roman Emperor, renews these appeals for help because the Byzantines had a really serious problem. Not only had they lost a major battle, but, and I wish I had a map to show you this, but imagine a map of Syria and Turkey in your mind. Turkey, or Asia Minor, modern Turkey, um, was the breadbasket of the Byzantine Empire and it was the primary recruiting ground for the Byzantine army. 
And as a result of the Battle of Manzikert, the Byzantines lost almost all of Asia Minor. So they lost their food source and they lost their military recruit source. That's really serious. So begging for help from the West. And finally, in 1094, 1095, Pope Urban II, who was having, experiencing a temporary let up in the investiture controversy, <coughs> entertained these embassies, set up a serious council, series of councils, one of which uh, he let the Byzantine ambassadors address, pretty, pretty obviously carefully managed the PR for this so that he could generate widespread support across Western Europe for a project to help the Byzantines. Not just to help the Byzantines, remember I've told you that there's a problem of pilgrimage and everybody knows it, it's been around for about a hundred years now. People know there's an issue, we can't get through to these holy places which, yeah, sorry John, they're thinking about it as holy. Uh, again, you've got to understand what's motivating them. They're not Protestants and they're not modern people, so they're not thinking in any of those ways. You can agree with the way they think or not agree. I would not dream of imp impinging on your freedom to make your choices that way. Uh, but if you want to understand them, you've got to understand how they're thinking. Uh, we can't get to these places, so we're being asked to help. Let's go do it. Um, he ends up in November of 1095 in south central France at Clermont, C L E R M O N T, Clermont, if you don't want to be French about it. And at the end of the council that he holds in Clermont, he goes out into a field outside the city on the 27th of November, 1095, probably cold and sleety and windy, and he preaches a sermon. Now, unfortunately, no one remembered to get out their cell phones and video it. There are no YouTube videos of this and no precise uh, transcriptions of what he said. Well, we have are five different versions of what he said, uh, but they overlap in some very important ways. Uh, so we have a pretty good sense of what he said. He said that Jerusalem needed them, that they had military skills, and they should use them to help Jerusalem and help the Eastern Christians, by which he would mean the Byzantines. He did, in fact, mention the fact that they tended to beat up on each other because they had military skills and said, take your military skills and do something worthwhile with it. Somebody needs you. You can do your thing. Just go do it in a profitable way. And do it, he said, for the remission of sin. By which he meant, if I were saying it today for perfect clarity, I would say temporal, uh, the, the remission of the temporal penalties of sin. Well, that's what he meant and his theological hearers understood it. We tend not to understand it when we read it, but that is what he meant. Do this because it's the will of God. Yes? If his sermon had somehow survived in, in its entirety, would the way the mainstream West sees the Crusades, would that be different at all? I doubt it because there are other reasons. There's, there's enough overlap in those five versions that we've got a pretty good idea what he said. Uh, I don't think so. It's a nice idea, but I think that people have their presuppositions and they don't want them challenged. <laughs> yeah. Go for remission of sin, God wills it. And the, and the people listening to him took up this cry uh, in southern French in Provençal, Deus le volt. Uh, in Latin, Deus volt, God wills it. Uh, another way to put it is take temporary vows to do this. Uh, and that does something interesting. It introduces an element of the monastic into this particular kind of penitential pilgrimage. Liberate Christian, liberate Jerusalem rather. Serve God and fellow Christians and expiate your sins at the same time. Now there's a whole <coughs> pardon me, other thing going on in Western culture, Western medieval culture in this time period that we really don't have time to explore, so let me just tell you. You have to take it on faith. There's a major initiative on the part of the church to take the values of the monastery, which is complete dedication to God, and to monasticize society. Let's take the principles of the monk's life, which is total surrender to God, total possession by God. And let's teach lay people who are not in a monastery and who still have to be blacksmiths or knights or millers or mothers or whatever, 
let's teach them how to take these values and live them, adapt them to their own life. That's been a theme in Catholic spirituality over the last thousand years. Uh, not always well lived, but it keeps surfacing again and again. We need to get these values out into the wider world. And it had, that, that campaign had started 9th, 10th, 11th, 10th and 11th centuries. So this is another way of doing that. Let's introduce an element of the monastic into this pilgrimage thing. And it gets an unexpectedly powerful response. There's a reason why Billy Graham used the, the phrase crusade for some of the stuff he did. You heard Campus Crusade for Christ, things like that. Uh, you get a kind of a phenomenon at the end of this speech of people coming forward, not to accept Jesus uh, exactly, but to take the cross. This had been kind of managed uh, apparently because there were strips of cloth handy and they could be affixed to people's clothing. Now what Alexius and the Byzantines and what the Pope and the people that he had been talking to apparently envisioned was a movement of lords with their retainers, uh, professional military, professional politicians as it were, who knew what they were doing and he got that, he got it very widely. He didn't get any kings for a variety of reasons, but he got some very high lords and he got brothers of kings and some counts who were essentially sovereign in their own areas. But he also got a very powerful response from ordinary people and that was a little bit problematic. It's a, a tribute to the degree to which the devotional work of the church, the campaign of the church to get these monastic values out into wider society had been pretty successful. That He gets this kind of response, a powerful response from ordinary people. And that one's kind of hard to manage and it doesn't really amount to very much because what happens is there are some low-end knights and some popular preachers who are sort of appointed leaders of what we call the people's crusade, the ordinary people. And there is an idea on these people's part that they are somehow more sanctified than the uh, lords of society. It's an idea that's still around. Uh, and they decide they don't need to wait for the professionals and they're just going to go off and do God's will. Why do we need to wait? Why do we need to plan if we're doing God's will? God will take care of it. I have a Facebook friend who put something, there was some problem we were discussing. Her response was, I'm not worried, all's in the Father's hands. Well, that's very pious of you, uh, but maybe the Father wants you to do a little bit of professional planning. <laughs> the People's Crusade didn't think that. They went off sort of befuddled the Byzantines who were looking at them like, who are you and why are you here and what in the heck am I going to do with you? Basically they shipped them across into Asia Minor. The People's Crusade said, where's some Turks, let's go kill them, but that's not the way it worked out. The Turks were professional military and they lured them into an ambush and killed most of them. Which was actually useful to the proper First Crusade because it taught the Turks that when you got a major expedition from the West it wasn't anything to worry about. It was just a bunch of amateurs. That's not what's coming next. <clears throat> what's coming next is the proper First Crusade organized by professionals who knew what they were doing. They leave in 1096 and they're arriving in 1096 and 1097 in Constantinople. The Byzantine Emperor is still a little bit uneasy about these guys. He wanted, apparently, it's a little hard to tell exactly what he wanted, but he seems to have wanted to hire mercenaries that were under his direct control and that would make sense. And he's not real comfortable with the fact that he's got King's Brothers leading large armed retinues and the King's Brothers aren't going to want anybody telling them what to do. One of the First Crusade leaders is Bohemond of Taranto, who is a Norman ruler who's been operating in southern Italy and has been at war with the Byzantine Empire pretty regularly. So the Byzantines are not real pleased with some of what they're getting. And in typical Byzantine fashion, Alexius tries to manipulate them. He, ties, he tries to tie them to him by something that I think his staff meeting must have told him was a really clever idea. I can kind of imagine how this went down. You know, what you've got to do is you've got to understand these Western barbarians and use their own backward barbaric feudal vows on them. Make them vow uh, to be your man, to do homage to you and vow fealty to you. So he does it. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, I'll play like they want to play. I'll, make, I'll talk to them the, the way they want to be talked to. And he tells them that they must make these vows to him and they must vow to return any land they conquer that had been Byzantine land to the Byzantines. And in return, he promises to help them, feed them, 
guide them, support them, to come support them personally with an army. Now that was really cute and really clever, and he gets most of them to take the vow. There's one little thing that he overlooked that's going to cause a huge problem. Westerners, yes, took this kind of vow all the time. That's the way their society was held together. And they also expected people to keep their word, and if you didn't keep your word, then the deal's off. So what will happen if Alexius does not show up with an army to support the First Crusaders? Will they feel obligated to return his land to him? Nope. And they will feel quite morally justified in not doing it. He won't like it, but he will get caught in his own uh, attempt to manipulate them. He sends them across into Asia Minor and points them at a city that has become the capital city of the Seljuk Turks as they conquered Asia Minor, Nicaea. It's an important city to Christians. What Christian document comes from Nicaea in 325? The Nicene. the Nicene Creed, correct. So kind of central to Christianity. The Crusaders besiege it. They fight off a Turkish army that comes to relieve it. They're getting ready to take it, and that's very important to them. Uh, they know how to do logistics all right, but it's really hard to supply an army that far away when you don't have railroads and airplanes and highways and trucks. So one of the ways that they need to refuel is by capturing stuff, right? And they get ready, literally, the morning of the day they're going to assault Nicaea, somebody opens the gate and it's the Byzantines saying, hi guys, you can leave now. We came in the back way and took the surrender of the city. Well, the Crusaders now have two reasons to distrust the Byzantines. They've been manipulated by them when they got to Constantinople and they had their prize of Nicaea taken away from them after they bled for it. Now they can't loot it to get their own uh, support. They're not very happy about it. And uh, the relationship between them and the Byzantines slowly and steadily deteriorates. They go on into Asia Minor, <coughs> they forage for food, and they split up their forces into two columns, which is a bad idea, but you've got to get food, and everybody can't go through the same place because only the first people get food, if, that is, if that's the way you do it. They don't have radios, they don't have airplanes, they don't have drones, so they don't really know where each other are exactly, and interestingly, neither do the Turks. The Turks ambush one of the columns, and they think it's the whole crusade. The Crusaders immediately send off messengers to try to get the other half of the column, the other half of the Crusade, to come and help them, but they don't even know where they're going, so they're kind of not very optimistic. There's a terrible battle, <coughs> not going real well for the Crusaders, and all of a sudden, the other column shows up. And it delivers a heavy cavalry charge to the Turks. Remember, the Turks had thought that the Westerners weren't all that much, they weren't all that scary, because they dealt with the People's Crusade. But the People's Crusade was one thing, heavy Western cavalry delivering a shock charge was another thing, and that's about the last time the Seljuk Turks ever stood in place to take one of those charges, because it's not a good idea. They ran over them, drove off the Turks, and the Crusaders were then able to go on through the rest of the Seljuk domains pretty safely. Not easily. They badly needed food, and they started eating their war horses and having other problems, a lot of other problems. But by 1098, they had arrived um, in, it's the corner of the Mediterranean, uh, Cilician Armenia was what it was called then. I wish I had a map to show you, but imagine it in your mind's eye. There's a population there of Armenians who have been displaced from Armenia up in the Caucasus. They're Christians, and they're abused by the Seljuk Muslim Turks, and they're actually not treated very well by the Byzantines either. When the Westerners show up, the Armenians are quite pleased. One of the crusader leaders peels off and goes over to the city of Edessa, which is at the head of the Fertile Crescent. And the population there is so happy to see him that they make him their count. There's a slightly murky discussion of what went on. Some people have suggested that he may have overthrown the ruler of that uh, Armenian city, but it's pretty obvious that the Armenian population, at least, wanted him there. And he sets up the first crusader state, the county of Edessa, which is very useful to the Crusaders because the county of Edessa then sends them horses and food. As the main crusade goes on to attack the city of Antioch. Antioch is another one of those major ancient Christian cities. Antioch is the place where Christians were first called Christians. It's heavily associated with the <coughs> early Christian life of the New Testament. 
Byzantines had reconquered it in the 10th century, I think it was, and then lost it again. So it was a pretty good sized city still. They besieged it. There's an amazing story about that siege, which I do not have time to tell you, so look it up on your own. Uh, eventually they take it in 1098. Now, Antioch had been a Byzantine city. So they need to give it back, right? Problem is, Alexius has not shown up to support them, and they get word after they've taken the city that he set out with an army and then turned around and went home, which he had. It's true. So some of the crusader lords said, well, we need to keep the vow anyway, and others said, no, we don't. He broke it. It's not on. This is mine. If he wants it, let him come get it. So Antioch becomes the second crusader state, the principality of Antioch in 1098. Then the First Crusade goes down the coast of the Eastern Mediterranean, where there are a number of small Muslim powers, most of whom dislike their neighbors. And more than once, the Crusaders come to a local Muslim power who says, hey guys, I'll let you through my country if you'll promise to attack my neighbor to the south. I'll show you through. Uh, and the Crusaders don't really have any problem with this guy, so they say, sure, all right, we'll do that. And they do it. The, what, what the local Muslim powers are thinking is they're living in a shattered world and the Crusaders are just becoming one element, a new element. There's a new element in this shattered world. And furthermore, here's an important thing to remember that most moderns do not remember. There had already been a foreign military elite that had intruded into the area, displaced the ruling class, and ruled the people, the Turks coming in from the east. Now what you've got is a different foreign ruling elite, also horsemen, by the way, coming in from the west, who are removing a ruling elite and ruling a disparate collection of Middle Eastern peoples. And the thing to remember, just this is kind of a sideline or a footnote, is that through the period of the Crusades, what you really have is a Turkish and later a Mamluk ruling elite on the Muslim side, controlling local populations, and a Western Latin Catholic presence coming in from the West doing the exact same thing. You've got two elites from outside the area fighting each other, ruling a population, a local population under them. And at least one <coughs> Muslim writer said, rather chagrined, that the Crusaders were nicer to the local people than the Turks were. He might have been making points, uh, polemic points, but that is what he said. Well, they get to Jerusalem in 1099 in July. They have had hideous casualties. The casualty rate in the First Crusade has been variously estimated at maybe around 70%, which is hideous. Forget the exact number for an American infantryman in World War II, the likelihood that you had of being killed, but it was like 3, 4, 5%, something like that. In the German SS, which was ideologically motivated, which tended to stand and fight rather than running away, stand and fight and die, some of their casualty rates were up around 30-some percent. Some of the German submariners, I think, were around 30. Uh, the Crusades were around, the First Crusade was around 70. Now, you'll sometimes find, we'll, we'll talk about myths later on, but you'll sometimes find people saying that people went on crusade in order to get rich, make their fortune. Would you go on a expedition of any kind if you thought you were 70% likely to die? Would you try it? Most of us would not. Uh, they're not going to get rich. They're going on a penitential pilgrimage. They're going for the sake of their souls. They said it over and over again, and their actions match what they say. The problem is that modern people, like a colleague of mine a few years ago, and she's a French lit professor, told me that nobody ever did anything for a religious motivation, so you had to find the real reason behind what they're doing. How do you know nobody does anything for a religious reason? That's one of the major re reasons that people do things. Anyway, so they arrive at Jerusalem, and they have trouble getting in it. It's controlled by the Fatimids, and it's got massive fortifications. Well, compressing the story, it's a very interesting one. Three o'clock in the afternoon, Friday, July 15th, which they thought was significant because three o'clock in the afternoon is when Jesus died on the cross, uh, they broke into the city. Now, there are myths about that. There's a myth that there was this incredible massacre that's unique in the history of the world. Bill Clinton has propagated that myth, uh, <coughs> and that they killed everybody. They didn't kill everybody. The Muslim troops in the citadel surrendered and were paroled and sent off to Egypt. Uh, there were so many Jewish 
prisoners taken that two years later in 1101, there were still Jewish leaders in Alexandria, Egypt, sending out fundraising appeals to try to get money to ransom these Jews. However, the city was sacked. It fell to storm. And by the rules of war, uh, historically, when a city falls to storm, the city and everything and everyone in it belong to the conquerors and they can do whatever they want to them. That's the rules of war. You may not like it and I certainly would never want to see that happen. Ugh. Uh, but that's the historical expectation. People have done extensive research. There was an Israeli scholar who researched this and said that's no different from any other storm and massacre of any other city. There's no reason to say that this is unusual. The reaction from the Muslim, <coughs> pardon me, Muslim world was rather indifferent at first. Remember the Muslim world was fractured. They were busy with their own affairs. There was one or two poets that said, oh, woe is us. We have lost the city with the furthest mosque in it, uh, but not very much. It was mostly just a kind of a shrug, well, there's a new power in the area. So now you have three crusader states, Edessa, Antioch, and Jerusalem. And 10 years later in 1109, there was a fourth one added. They went up north and cleaned up all those little Muslim principalities that had played off the crusaders against their enemies and set up the county of Tripoli so that they owned most of the eastern Mediterranean coast. John, how long do we have? Uh, at least till noon. All right, so another 30 minutes. Good. There were, however, problems in the area. This was a very fragile little kingdom, vulnerable, hard to control, and frankly, most of them seem not to have thought that they were going to succeed. What they really had had in mind was, we're going on crusade, we're going to go as far as we can, we're going to lay down our lives for our friends and go to heaven. And lo and behold, they don't all die and they get to Jerusalem and there's a fair bit of looking at each other and saying, now what do we do? <laughs> we won. And, and you've got to set up a state. There's a question about what the state is. Some people seem to have thought it would be a, an ecclesiastical state run by the church, but in the end it turned into a secular monar monarchy, although a very special secular monarchy. Um, that specialness is indicated by the flag of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. If you know anything about heraldry rules, you're not allowed to put metal on metal in heraldry. You can't put gold on silver, for instance. You have to have metal on color or color on metal or there's some other details to it. But the flag of Jerusalem being special, you are allowed to put metal on metal and the flag of Jerusalem is the Jerusalem cross, the big cross with four little crosses. The cross is gold, the background is silver because it's special. And that's how people viewed it. It was a special kingdom. Dangerous area though, vulnerable to attack difficult to defend, hard to control, and always over the next 200 years <coughs> the crusader states would be desperately short of manpower. And there was a problem with the pilgrims. They had gone into the area to ensure the safety of pilgrims, but pilgrims were still by no means safe. They did not control the area well enough, uh, and even in the early years of the 12th century they were constantly getting attacked, a problem that would lead to the creation of the military orders as we'll see this afternoon. And then, after a couple of decades, of the 1120s, there is the rise of what historians call the Islamic Counter-Crusade. It's a form of jihad, but this jihad is specifically aimed at reversing the Crusaders' achievements. And it's led at first by a, a Muslim emir named Zengi, Z-E-N-G-I. By all accounts, and I'm talking about the accounts of his friends, he was a nasty man, vicious, cruel, ambitious. Uh, he wanted to make himself the ruler of a reunified Middle Eastern Islam. And he quickly figured out that one of the ways of scoring points amongst the general Muslim population and amongst the important people like the Caliph, figurehead though he was, was to attack the Christian crusaders and defeat them. And every time you did, you got points, as it were. It advanced your claim to lead Islam, it advanced your claim to become the Sultan, the authority is what that word means, under the Caliph. So Zengi started doing this. The Crusader states were vulnerable, they were undermanned, and on Christmas Eve 1144, <coughs> Zengi's troops broke into the city of Edessa while its count was away its crusader count, 
took the city and massacred. It was a, a genocide, actually, because they targeted all the Frankish Latin Christians. They wanted to kill not just everybody, but this specific kind of person. Sorry, just to clarify, you don't mean Odessa in present day Ukraine? Not Odessa, but Edessa. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you know what the Fertile Crescent looks like? Yeah. It's the top of the Fertile Crescent. It's in Turkey now. It's called Urfa. But, yeah, it's one of the cities that Abraham might possibly have come from. But so it's considered a holy city in some ways, yeah, if you accept the idea of holy cities. Um, where was I? So uh, the Frankish Latin Christians are wiped out. There are still Armenian Christians. That's the other half of the population, or more than half. And they wanted their crusader count to come back. So they appealed to him to rescue them. In the meantime, uh, Zengi ticked off one of his slaves. The story is that he said to the, the slave offended him, spilled something on him or something, and he said, I'm going to kill you for that. But it's late and I'm tired, so I'll do it tomorrow morning. And the slave had a little bit of time to think and thought, well, I'm going to be killed tomorrow morning one way or another, so I'm taking you with me. And he murdered him. Zengi died and was succeeded by his son Nur ad-Din or Nur al-Din. Meanwhile, the Armenian natives of Edessa appealed for their Latin count to rescue them. Nur ad-Din heard about it and came back and massacred all the Armenians for having dared to ask the crusader count to come back. So Edessa is pretty much wiped out. Something that will become a habit in the Crusades, the Latin East tends to be neglected by the West until there's a disaster like this. You've lost one of the four crusader states. And then the West goes, oh crap, we should have been doing something about it. And they mount another penitential pilgrimage to rescue the mess. This one we call the Second Crusade. Remember, those are our terms, not theirs. The Second Crusade. It's run by the French King Louis VII and the German Emperor Conrad III. And it is an embarrassing failure. Let's just leave it at that. It's such an embarrassing failure that for the next 40 years, nobody wants to go on crusade. Let's not talk about it. Our grandfathers did really well. Our fathers sucked, and we're not going. Because, <laughs> man, this is a bad trend. <laughs> Look where this is going. So they don't do anything much to help. Things kind of settle down also in the East after this. So there's a certain amount of complacency in the West. In the East, Fatimid ruled Egypt gets weaker and starts collapsing. And both the Crusaders in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and, and Antioch and Tripoli and the Muslims under Nur ad-Din realize whoever gets Egypt is going to have a huge advantage over the other side because Egypt is rich and powerful. It has a huge population. It has food resources. It's just an awesome prize. And whoever can seize it, it's going to fall. Whoever can seize it will have an advantage. So Jerusalem and Nur ad-Din race to try to get it. They keep invading it, and each time one of them invades it, they push it a little closer to the edge. And finally it falls off, but the rhythm is wrong. And Nur ad-Din's generals get it. The Muslim side gets Egypt. The general who takes it is a Kurdish officer named Shurka in 1169. He promptly dies and control is taken by his nephew. Who would that be? Saladin. Saladin. In the West, one of the most famous of Muslim rulers. In the, in the Muslim world, Nur ad-Din, Zengi, and the Mamluk Baibars have actually got better reputations because they were more fierce and ruthless. Uh, and are viewed as having accomplished more. But in the West, Sal Saladin has this reputation for chivalry, and he's kind of a good bad guy. Saladin begins to gnaw away at the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which by 1174 is ruled by a leper. The King of Jerusalem has leprosy. His name is Baldwin IV. Incidentally, Baldwin is the one who changed medieval and Western views of leprosy because of the heroism with which he bore his disease. But that's another story. And you might be familiar with Baldwin from that god-awful movie. Yeah. Some of my colleagues show that movie to their crusade classes so that you can critique it and tell them what's wrong about it. But the problem is you've seen the images, and it's a really beautiful movie and a compelling movie and about 180 degrees wrong. If you want to know what really happened, just flip it. No patriarch of Jerusalem would ever have said, I'm frightened, let's, let's convert to Islam and we can always apostatize later. They would just never have done that. 
Uh, Queen Sibylla in the movie is depicted as this little, sorry, but she's a slut that goes off to cheat on her husband every time he turns his back. Do you know what the reality was? Sibylla and her husband had enemies who wanted to separate them, and she spent all her time scheming and plotting with her husband so that they couldn't. And if I were Sibylla, I would come back from the dead and haunt Ridley Scott for having slandered me like that, but <laughs> I'm not her. Just, just please don't watch that movie. It's terrible. Or at least watch it with the sound off. <laughs> if they'd said it was a fantasy movie, it would have been awesome because it's beautiful and compelling, and that's exactly what's wrong with it. So uh, there's a lot of fake news in that movie. Part of the fake news in that movie has to deal with one of the crusade leaders named Renaud of Châtillon, who's depicted, he's the red-bearded red -haired, red guy who's drunk and dribbles in his beard and beats people up. Yeah, That is just, again, flat wrong. He wasn't some kind of crazy, messy cowboy who was a bigot and a racist. Uh, he was geopolitically brilliant. He understood what Saladin was doing, and with very limited resources, he kept frustrating Saladin, which is why Saladin hated him. Get that guy out of my face, he's stopping me. Uh, he was a dedicated Catholic and a very capable defender of the Crusader states, so more fake news. There's a lot of stuff told about the Crusades that's wrong. Kingdom of Heaven, the movie, is about the Battle of Hattin in 1187 in which Saladin invades the kingdom, he did, brought them to battle in an unpleasant uh, place for them. It's actually on the slopes of the mountain where the Sermon on the Mount was probably given and destroyed the army, just wiped it out. The only thing, by the time Saladin was done with them, the only thing that was left of the kingdom of Jerusalem was the city of Tyre and the castle of Belfort. Well, what do you think the West will do about that? There will be a crusade. That provokes the third crusade with Richard the Lionheart, Richard I, Philip, Augustus of France, and Frederick Barbarossa of Germany. It's an event that created all kinds of chivalrous legends, and frankly, some of the legends were realities. I don't have time to tell you about them, but there are some awesome stories from the Third Crusade. If any of you have ever played D&D, &D, it's like Richard the, the First is a ninth level warrior, and he's killing kobolds. If you didn't play D&D, &D, just, let, just let it go. Don't worry about it. Uh, the, <laughs> the point is, he shouldn't have been able to do some of the stuff. This should be fantasy. It shouldn't be real. He shouldn't have been able to pull it off. But he was. He was quite the leader. It's where our chivalrous legends about Saladin come from. Uh, the Third Crusade manages to recover much of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but not Jerusalem. So you have the irony in the next hundred years of a Kingdom of Jerusalem that doesn't have Jerusalem in it. And anyway, Jerusalem is not defensible without holding Egypt. The local barons have known that. Richard I realizes it and makes a point about it. A little footnote, a little side note. As part of the Third Crusade, a fifth crusader state gets founded, Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. It had a renegade Byzantine lord. He had broken away from the Byzantine Empire. He tried to prey on Richard's sister and girlfriend, when they came by and were shipwrecked in a storm and had a problem, not shipwrecked, but inconvenienced, uh, and he tried to prey on them, and Richard came up and kicked the guy's butt. He was not happy with the way that he had treated his sister and his girlfriend, uh, and he'd captured his island. That's kind of really the way to even things out. Somebody abuses your girlfriend, you take his island away from him. That's my man. Uh, takes the island, doesn't have anything to do with it, so he sells it to the Knights Templar. We haven't talked about them yet, but we will in the afternoon. And they sell it to a former king of Jerusalem, and it becomes a crusader state until 1571, when the Ottoman Turks take it away from Christians. Well, they haven't recovered Jerusalem. They need to take Egypt first. So there is a fourth crusade, 1200 to 1204, roughly. depends on when you want to set the beginning date. The Fourth Crusade is notorious for not having accomplished what it set out to do, and on the left, um, and in some other quarters too, people will cite the Fourth Crusade as a good example of why Crusaders are all greedy brutes who should be despised. Well, as usual, the historical reality is much more complex and much more subtle. What happened, uh, they designed the Crusade, they designed it to hit Egypt because they knew that was a military necessity. They didn't tell people where they were going because they thought they wouldn't want to go to Egypt first. Uh, it doesn't seem like a good goal for a penitential pilgrimage. It was. But that's not the problem. 
The problem is that its planners grossly miscalculated the number of people who would go on crusade. They went around and polled people and asked them, will you go, will you go, will you go? And everybody said, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. That sounds great. Let's do this. So they wrote down the number of people who said yes. Was that smart? No, because about a third of them didn't keep their word. The planners had gone to Venice and gotten Venice to agree to stop doing anything else for a year, stop making money, and instead build warships and transports and to join them on the Fourth Crusade. And they would pay them X amount of money for their labors. So Venice is already sort of mortgaged to do this too. The Fourth Crusade gets to Venice and it's a third short of the people and therefore a third short of the money that it needs. And the Venetians say, I'm sorry, we've got a contract, you've got to pay us. We haven't been doing anything but this for a year. And about that time, a Byzantine prince who's lost a civil war shows up and he says, hey guys, if you'll come help me take my, my, my kingdom back, my throne back, I will give you all the money and all the men you need. The Pope says, don't do it. And the Fourth Crusaders look at each other and say, we haven't got any choice. So they do. They go to Constantinople. He doesn't keep his word. They put him back on his throne, but he doesn't keep his word because he couldn't. And he had to know that. His treasury didn't have the money. And so they're sitting in Constantinople in 1204 out of bus fare and out of lunch. And then another Byzantine murders him so they don't have any hope of doing anything and they take the city. Well, that doesn't do much for the Holy Land. It's a lot more understandable if you actually read the sources instead of just having an opinion before you read the sources, but that's less fun, right? So the Fifth Crusade tries 1217 to 1221, directly aims at Egypt and gets tantalizingly close, just a millimeter away from taking Egypt, and it doesn't. So the Sixth Crusade tries. Emperor Frederick II, who's the closest thing the Middle Ages ever produced to an atheist, probably, uh, and who's, he really doesn't like Christianity very well. Frederick II goes off on crusade. He manages to tick off the Pope on the way and he's excommunicated, which really raises certain questions of how you can go on a penitential pilgrimage directed by the Pope when the Pope has excommunicated you. But he does. He's skeptical, he's worldly, he's anti-papal. He talks to the Muslims about how much he thinks Christians are stupid and the Muslims don't like it. The Muslims are like, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be a good Christian. Don't be a bad Christian. That sucks. They, that really is their reaction. Be a decent Christian. Stop being a jerk. Um, and he's not. So they don't like him. The local people don't like him. He doesn't fight. He negotiates with the Muslims. And what he gets is the right for Christians to administer Jerusalem but not defend it. So anytime the Muslims want to take it back, they just take it. And the local people are so mad at him that he, has to, he tries to sneak out of the city down to the docks early in the morning when no one will see him, but they get wind of it and they all empty their garbage cans and throw garbage at him on the way out. It's, there's so many things here that would make really interesting movies. It's so sad not to have made a true one when you had the chance. Anyway, so they're back in Jerusalem, but they're not really back in Jerusalem. And in 1244, a Central Asian nomadic people come through. They're called the Khwarezmians. Just spell that however you want because that's what everybody else does. There's no standard spelling for Khwarezmians. They come through the area and they're really kind of vandals. They tear stuff up and they sack and burn Jerusalem and it's a bad sack. They destroy the graves of the kings of Jerusalem. They kill the priests, and drive people out of it. They leave Jerusalem a smoldering wreck. They go on down to Egypt and team up with Saladin's descendants and then come back into the area where they attack a coalition of the Crusader states and the Muslims from Damascus, who neither one like the Egyptians or the Khwarezmians. And in 1244, there's a battle called La Forbi, F-O-R-B-I-E. You don't hear as much about that one as, as Hattin, but it's actually worse than Hattin. It's a terrible defeat for the Crusader side. They lose about as many men, and the problem is the Crusaders would recover from Hattin, but they never recover from La Forbi. Uh, La, L-A, Forbi, F-O-R-B-I-E. There's a stunning number of casualties amongst both the secular lords and the military orders. The secular lords cannot replace their losses. 
the military orders can, the seculars can't. And after 1244, after La Forbi, increasing numbers of crusader lords begin to sell their castles and their lordships to the military orders and just quit. We can't do it. The military orders muster the resources to hold them for a while, but if you think about it, that's not a very good recipe for long-term success. It's like selling out to a corporation. Interestingly, the Egyptian side at La Forbi for was commanded by a Mamluk Amir. His name was Baibars. He was a Caucasian from that warrior slave caste, and we'll hear more about him. Yeah, question? No, oh, you're stretching is good. <laughs> well, disaster, crusade, right? That's the pattern. There's a, there's a crusade. Seventh crusade follows. Louis IX, the king of France, who I was telling you about earlier, goes on crusade from 1248 to 1250, like the Fifth Crusade, the Seventh Crusade goes to Egypt and almost succeeds. At a critical moment, one of Louis's brothers disobeys an order and everything goes to hell in the proverbial handbasket, falls apart, and it falls apart so badly that Louis is captured. And the King of, Dr or the King of France has to pay the equivalent of several billion dollars to get him back. It's not good. They nearly kill him. You'd think Louis would run for home, that would be the practical thing to do, but the Kingdom of Jerusalem is having serious succession problems, serious central authority problems, so Louis stays for four years after that crusade. He stays from 1250 to 1254 and serves as acting King of Jerusalem, fortifies, leads them, sets policy, but he can't stay forever. Four years is actually a terribly long time to be gone and his kingdom is screaming for him to come home, so he finally leaves. In the midst of the Seventh Crusade's disruptions of Egypt, those Mamluk warrior slaves took it over, overthrew its leaders and took it over. And the Mongols were increasingly coming into the area as well, so it's a time of upheaval and change, on, particularly on the Muslim side. In 1260, the Mongols and the Mamluks confront each other at the Battle of Ain Jalut, different ways to spell it, but the usual is A-Y-N, J-A-L-U-T, inside the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. It's in Galilee. And that fellow Baibars is once again the commander and he defeats the Mongols. This is the first time that a non-Mongol force has defeated a major Mongol army in a critical engagement. Everybody thought the Mongols were unbeatable, but they weren't. This really raises Baibars prestige and he murders his own sultan shortly thereafter and takes command. In the next 17 years, between 1260 and 1277, Baibars tore the Christian states apart bite by bite. In 1268, he took Antioch, the second greatest crusader city. Some really interesting stories there that I don't have time to tell you. So there's another crusade. There's an eighth crusade. Louis IX again. King James I of Aragon in Spain, and the man who will be Edward I, two historians just call at this point Lord Edward. James runs into a storm and goes home. Louis stops off at Tunisia where he dies of dysentery, and only Edward gets to the Holy Land with too few people to do anything worthwhile. The Eighth Crusade is the last of the big named crusades, our names, to rescue the Holy Land. Nobody knew it at the time, but it was. Baibars died in 1277, very possibly poisoned by accident by a cup he was going to give to somebody else and drank himself. He's not a very nice person. Succeeded by an emir named Kelavan, who continues doing Baibars' work, tearing the Crusaders apart. In 1289, Kelavan takes Tripoli, and in 1291, he takes the acting capital of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, Acre, and the kingdom is gone. There's a few little spots that the Christians hold, but they lose heart and abandon them. They thought they'd take it back. They thought it wasn't the end. We know they didn't. There were no subsequent major crusades to the Holy Land. However, 1291 isn't the end of crusading. It goes on through the Middle Ages. There's a Cypriot crusade of Alexandria in 1365, a couple of good-sized crusades to Smyrna in Western Asia Minor between 1343 and 51, crusade of Nicopolis in Eastern Europe in 1398, Crusade of Varna in Eastern Europe in 1444, and none of them are really successful. One of the problems is that there's a group of Turks called the Ottomans, founded in 1299. 
One of those sides of those interminable Byzantine civil wars draws them into Europe. That again, it's really stupid. In the 1340s, they get the Turks inside Europe. The Turks look around and go, hey, this is kind of nice. Let's take it. And within a little over 100 years, they had. They set their sights on destroying the Byzantine or East Roman Empire and took Constantinople May 29th, 1453. Well, there are various more or less desperate crusading leagues, at least, against the Turks thereafter, and some of them are after <coughs> the Protestant Reformation, such as 1571 Lepanto, and probably the last crusade, which is 1683, the Siege of Vienna, when the city was rescued from the Turks by a combined Polish and German force that really was a crusade. And if you ever encounter the, Pol the um, Swedish power metal group Sabaton, uh-huh, Winged Hussars. It's a pretty good musical depiction in heavy metal music. I can't believe I even recommended that. Uh, it's a pretty good little musical historical vignette of what happened. After 1683, there's not much of any crusades, though historians debate when the last one happened. Theoretically, a pope could still call a crusade today. This one certainly won't. Uh, but the machinery is still there legally. Legally, there is no possible, practical possibility of one, though. And there hasn't been for hundreds of years. The Reformation harmed the possibility, and in order for a crusade to work, you have to have Christian monarchs, and there basically aren't any. So it's not going to happen again. The Crusades were about defending Christendom, remember, not attacking Muslims, so that you can apply them to other threats, external ones, even in internal ones. They were applied to an internal threat with the Albigensian heresy in the early 13th century in southern France. Uh, even sometimes there were heretical movements in Italy that were targets of crusades. Uh, elements of the Spanish Reconquista are crusades. Crusading is happening in Spain, and there are a lot of expeditions in the Baltic that are also crusades. Sorry, what was the Albigensian? Albigensian. Um, there is a dualist heresy, it's a Gnostic heresy in southern France, um, that was creating an entire parallel church system in the early 13th century. Um, Wow, how to compress that quickly. People tried preaching, and that's why the Dominican Order was founded, to try to talk them out of their heresy, and they wouldn't go. They had ideas like that you shouldn't have sex or eat meat or things like that. Uh, it's, a, it's clearly heresy. Shouldn't own property. Uh, and when that failed, one of the Albigensians assassinated a papal legate, and they aimed a crusade at the area and finally reduced it. There's, that is a really inadequate brief description of what happened, but, uh, yeah? Why don't we 